Hello there, welcome back to The Closet Historian. I recently asked many of you over on Instagram and here on the community tab on YouTube for some questions for me, or if you had any questions for me. It's been about a year since I did a Q&A. I will put a playlist here actually, or a card up to a playlist of my other Q&A videos here on the channel, just because there were some questions that um, I had answered before, and so I probably won't re-answer I'm trying not to repeat any questions that I've answered before in this video, but if I didn't answer your question here, it's probably because I answered it before. So I will put a link to those other videos here if you want to hear me answer even more questions after this, which after all my rambling, I'd be surprised if you do, but feel free. I did end up breaking this down in my Instagram story when I was soliciting questions into kind of categories. So I've got like vintage style questions, sewing questions and writing questions kind of. So those will be like major themes of this Q and A, but I am gonna start with some frequently asked questions or also like kind of video requests that I felt like I had done. So I'll be pointing you towards a couple of other videos as well. First question here is from Saber Ducky and they asked, do you ever think you'll be a full-time YouTuber? Which I, I am, that, that this is my only job. So uh, as of November, I left my part-time job. For those of you who don't know, the series on my channel here called Side Hustlin, um, I have a playlist of all of them, is kind of my journey uh, becoming a, like trying to become a full-time content creator here on YouTube. And then like my other side hustles as well, wanting to do patterns, wanting to write books. Um, which I do write books, I just don't publish books. Um, so if you wanna know more about like kind of my career journey or kind of like hear more vlog-ish content from me, behind the scenes sort of content from me, check out my series Side Hustling here on the channel because that's where I talk about side hustling, basically. A frequently asked question I get a lot is about my haircut and Dahlia sews asks, does it have layers? Um, my haircut is just a basic straight cut bob. I don't have any layers or anything fancy going on really with my hair, my basic haircut. Um, I do have a couple things going on and that is I have baby bangs, of course. Mine are t slightly, slightly rounded on the edges, but mostly straight across. And then I have an undercut behind here. Um, it's actually really grown out right now, but about a third of my hair behind my neck is just shaved off. Um, and that's because I do have quite thick hair, so you can't really tell. And it makes styling it much faster because of course I have a third less hair. And if I ever want to do something a little bit more futuristic or something with my hair, I can just put it up and then I have the back of it shaved like that, which is, kind of fun. I like it. Um, I really like having an undercut. It's been great for me. I've had it for over a year now. If you would like to see what my hair looks like unstyled before I do anything to it, what my haircut looks at its most natural state, I will put a link to a tutorial of mine where I start with my hair natural and then curl it into my vintage style with this haircut. So if you're interested in seeing what my haircut looks like before I style it, go ahead and check out that video in the description below. Another frequently asked question here from Madeline Kolk, which is, what is your favorite red lipstick? And I wear ColourPop liquid matte lipsticks in whatever red shade they've come out with you know, most recently. Whenever they come out with a red, I kind of want to try it. So I throw it in my cart usually because they're not too, too expensive. It's not like a Dior lipstick where it's like, you know, crazy expensive each one. So I think it's worth trying out a couple if you are interested in liquid matte lipstick formulas. If you've never tried one, they kind of dry down and they are definitely a drier formula than say a bullet lipstick, which is what I have on today. This one is Money Moves, which is a luxe lipstick from ColourPop, but all my red lipsticks are from ColourPop. I wear the shades called Season 10 the most, but I think that one might have been discontinued as well, as long as my, with my other favorite shade from them, which was called Ribbon, which is also discontinued, but any of their reds I like. Most often I'm wearing Season 10. I think I bought some backups after having been burned by Ribbon before, I bought some backups of Season 10, but I like all of their reds. I think they're worth giving a try. I really love ColourPop. If you've been on this, if you've been around here, a while on this channel, you know, I'm a big fan of ColourPop. Another really common question I get that kind of perplexes me is how do you keep your costume jewelry clean? And I got this from a couple of people and I don't do anything to keep my costume jewelry clean. I, I mean, I don't get it dirty as far as I can tell. Um, so like, I mean, I put my jewelry on after I've like sprayed my hair and perfume and things like that. So I guess it doesn't, like I don't wanna get it sticky or anything with hairspray. So I always put my jewelry on last after I've done my hair and makeup. So like, that's, I guess, something I do to keep it clean, but I've never really noticed my costume jewelry getting dirty. So I, I don't clean it in any way. Um, I've never bought anything that was particularly dirty or tarnished or anything like that. I, I don't do anything to maintain my costume jewelry other than store it nicely. And if you are curious how I store my jewelry or anything in my vintage collection, feel free to check out my closet tour video. I'll put a card up to that here as well. Um, Cause I know that was another question I got a lot of is like, how do you store your things? So you can see in that video how I store all of my things. Again, another frequently asked question, are your books available to buy? And sad sadly, no, I'm sorry, not yet. Um, when they are, again, I will never shut up about it. So you should be glad that they're not, to be honest, because I'll just become such a marketing shill for myself when they are. 
Um, if and when they are, I should say. But I don't have a literary agent as of yet. I do not work with a publisher as of yet. So no, my books are not available to buy anywhere. I have zero interest in self-publishing at this time. So um, they're not available at all. I'm sorry. Not yet. One one day. And again, when, when they are, you will not get me to be quiet about that. So you'll know. Trust me. Trace and Tulu Musker ask if I will be adding more makeup tutorials onto my other channel. Um, for those of you who don't know, I do have a separate beauty channel. I don't update it very often at all, hence this question. And the problem is right now, I just don't have enough time to. I obviously love playing with crazy eyeshadow and stuff like that, but I just don't have the time to film and edit those videos right now, just because I'm trying to focus on this channel and writing and sewing and like sometimes having any kind of social life and it just doesn't leave much time for playing with glitter, sadly. So I'm sorry that I haven't been uploading over there. I would like to more in the future. I just don't have the time right now. Megan underscore CLS. I'm interested in what kind of sources you use, books, magazines, internet. Um, and I guess I use all of those sources at one time or another. I find inspiration in all kinds of places for studying vintage fashion and vintage, so vintage inspired sewing. Vintage inspired sewing. Can't speak. But I'll put a link to another video of mine in the description here where I actually have a whole video about my favorite books for 20th century fashion and studying vintage in general. So I'll put a link to that video in the description. And then other than that, I just use Pinterest mostly. So again, there'll be a link in the description to my Pinterest if you want to check out the kind of things that inspire me over there. Josie underscore RC also asked if there are any 40s or 50s fashion books I like. So again, I talked about those in that video below. Sunray Dolls asks, is it possible to make your own hat pins? Where would I start? And the answer is yes. Um, I don't, I haven't done it for a very long time, but I know I found like the long pin findings. I found them before at like Michael's or Joann's, the crafts, major craft stores here in the US. I'm sure you can find them online as well. Just type in hat pin finding into Etsy and sure there'll be something that comes up, um, but it's definitely possible to make your own hat pins for sure. I do have a couple of historic costuming related questions here. So I put them all together, um, starting with KM Cruz. Cruz, Cruz, um, asks just to, for me to talk about costuming a little bit more and what time periods I made, um, if I have any photos and such. And listen, I, I look at the analytics. I know no one visits the Closet Historian blog, but it does still exist. And it started back in 2013. That's how this all started, the Closet Historian blog, as opposed to YouTube. Um, so I started by blogging and I used to blog a lot about my historic costuming. So if you would like to see my adventures in historic costuming, feel free to check out my blog link in the description. Um, but I did used to do more costuming, mostly 18th century things, and then some like corsetry and Edwardian stuff. So that all can be found on my blog still. But um, I don't do historic costuming anymore, mostly because I can't afford to. Um, I neither have the time that it takes to create, you know, very intricate gowns and things like that. I don't have the kind of time to devote to the hobby anymore like that. And I don't have enough money to do it. Um, historic costuming can be, I mean, you can do it on a budget. It's not like it's impossible. I just, you know, for to, for enough silk yardage to make an 18th century gown, it's expensive. It's expensive and I can't afford to do it right now. So I just don't do any historic costume anymore, mostly because of budgetary and time constraints. So it's not like I, my interest in historic fashion didn't go anywhere. I still am very interested in historic dress and I love costuming exhibits at museums and like historic fashion exhibits, but I just can't afford to participate in costuming right now. The Vintage Guidebook asks two questions. Um, the first is, have I ever been to costume college? And I have not. I've never even considered going, to be honest, just because I don't have the disposable income to travel at all. Or I don't, I don't even have the income to make costumes anymore, let alone travel. So uh, it's never really been something I considered. I'm not a very, this is going to sound bad, social person. Uh, so like, I really don't think it'd be kind of my... Thing. Um, like cons and meetups and that kind of thing are just not really something I'm interested in. I'm very introverted. Um, so it's not really something I've ever been interested in, I guess. Um, and they also ask, how do you find time to write and sew and post? And the answer is there is not enough time. There's definitely not enough time. I am always looking for more time, if anything. Um, so I don't get all the things I want to get done, done ever. And I always constantly feel like I'm trying to play catch up and giving myself some serious anxiety, I think. Sewing in PJs asks, which same, honestly, um, about like the kind of date range of my style, like how far back in time would I go and how far forward in time. I don't have a strict date range for my style at all. I'm not strict about vintage style in general at all. Um, it's a pet peeve of mine, if anything. <laughs> um, I mean, each to their own, but like for me, I will wear 1950s style one day. I will wear uh, like a 1980s outfit the next day. I will wear 
acid wash mom jeans with like a tied shirt or a Star Wars shirt. I will wear a 1920s dress the day after that. I jump around. I don't have any rules. Um, as far as like how far back in time would I wear? I mean, I've, I have again done historic costume before. I don't find that's very applicable to my life now, but like I don't have any cutoff dates either forward or backwards really. So I don't like rules when it comes to something that's supposed to be fun like fashion. So I don't have any like set rules for my style when it comes to era or like mixing eras or like authenticity. I have no rules. I don't, I don't, I don't believe in rules in this arena. Here we have another question that is assuming that I'm more successful than I am. So thank you. Um, fan flip, Fanfic Chick asks, have you been approached by any of the pattern companies about a collaboration? Is that something you'd be interested in? I would love to get a hold of your patterns. Um, and, and no, n none of them have ever looked in my general direction, I promise you. Um, I am a tiny, tiny baby YouTuber in this vast ocean. Um, so I don't have enough of an audience. If we're going to talk in marketing terms here, I don't have enough of an audience to make me a worthwhile person to collaborate with, which not only stands for companies, but also like other YouTubers and stuff like that. Like I don't have a lot that I can bring to the table, unfortunately. That sounds really mean to me, but like, if we're gonna cut and dry marketing here, that's why no one's interested. Um, I don't know if I would be interested in working with a big pattern company because I'm more interested in having my own pattern line. I just can't afford to do it yet. So more on that in my last few side hustling videos if you want to know why I haven't released patterns yet. Madison of Uniquely Madison asks a couple of questions, but um, one of them being, what my favorite music as of late is and i've still been listening to lana del rey's latest album on major repeat so mostly that also the frozen 2 soundtrack because i loved that movie and those are some serious jams she also asks if i will be working with any sponsors and brands and no one no one is knocking on my door i can assure you um but there are a couple of brands i wouldn't mind working with mostly i think i'll be quite picky and selective if and when these opportunities arise because i have quite high like sustainability and like fair trade kind of requirements for anyone that I would want to actually work with. Um, and it would have to be like a brand that I actually like and believe in and stuff like that, because I, I just don't think I could, I don't think it's worth it otherwise. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm not privy to how much these deals are worth. So if like some, you know, if Amazon came to me and offered me a certain, like a crazy amount of money that I could like pay off my student loans or something, I would have a hard time refusing that. But I hope that I would be strong enough in that moment to do so. I don't know. It's a hard, like, I would like to make a living. And deals like that are how a lot of people on YouTube make a living. And it's a hard question. I think it's a big, complicated issue, really. But not one I have to deal with yet because no one's interested in working with me, so it's fine. She also asks, who are my favorite fashion designers' inspirations at the moment? Um, I haven't been following high fashion as much lately, um, although it was just couture week, so that's always nice. Um, I would say, uh, what's her name? The Austrian designer. Mm, Lena Hoschek, Hoschek, I can't say her name, but she's like my favorite modern designer right now, and that's because her line is basically just vintage reproduction, so <laughs> I can't afford to have any of her clothes, but I quite like her. She's probably my favorite current fashion designer person right now. I also have some YouTubing related questions here. This one is from Wyverns, Wyverns, I can't say this word, <laughs> wardrobe. Um, they ask, do I have any tips for someone wanting to start out in sewing and retro fashion YouTubing? Um, I film most of my sewing videos on this guy, uh, my iPhone. So um, not a very advanced setup here. Um, so if you have a phone, you too can film sewing videos, I suppose. Um, but like the rest of my videos and everything are filmed on a Nikon D5200 camera, which people have asked me if I recommend it. No, I don't. Um, I think I would rather have the Canon 70D personally or 80D um, for filming YouTube videos, but here I've got the Nikon 5200. I got it for my college graduation, university graduation many years ago. And so that's what I used to shoot on, but it's not ideal. It only films in 20 minute increments. So I have to remember to like restart the video every 20 minutes. And with my rambling, it's often, you know? Um, so I don't like that feature. Um, there's the autofocus isn't my favorite, so I don't really recommend my camera. Um, I I haven't tried any others to be able to recommend, but I know I don't really recommend mine, to be honest. Um, I do have a Rode shotgun microphone. I'll put the exact model here. Um, and I that was an investment that I'm really glad I made. I think having good sound quality is the most important thing about YouTubing, really, um, as far as equipment goes. Having sound quality over 
video quality is almost more important. So I think it's best to get an external microphone and work out how to do that kind of thing. Josie RC also asked about my filming setup. So the camera again, D5200 Nikon, not a huge, not like over the moon about it. Um, it's just what I have, so that's what I use. Um, the microphone again is the Rode, I forget, I feel like Video Mic Pro is what it's called. I will put it in the description as well. Um, and then as far as lights I use, I do have two like cheap softbox lights, which aren't even in this room right now. They're in front of my set in the other room, but I do also have a ring light. So I'll put a link to the same ring light that I use in the description as well. A few sewing related questions now. Christiana Gibbard asks, how do I finish my seams? Any suggestions for people with no serger? And I actually do have a video here on the channel all about different seam finishes that I like to use. So again, I will link that in the description below. <laughs> um, a lot of, there's gonna be a lot of links in the description of this one. But um, my favorite method to finish seams, like the nicest method I use in my own sewing to finish seams is using rayon seam binding. And I include that in that video um, or like how to do that in that video. But you can get hug snug rayon seam binding on line pretty easily. And I think that is the nicest finish, honestly. But I'm just too lazy most of the time. So I just run things through the serger more out of a time-saving measure than because it's the nicest finish available to me. You can also just use French seams, which encase the raw edges in them. It's just like a double process kind of seam finish. And then you can use bias binding or just cut them with pinking shears, really. So there are different methods. I think round seam binding is probably the nicest non-surging method. And I would put that above surging, honestly, in the niceness factor. Anybody can do anything asks, do you make a mess while sewing or do you keep it tidy as you go? And I don't just make a mess while I'm sewing. I make a mess while I'm cooking. I make a mess while I'm doing anything, really. Uh, <laughs> I'm living. I, I make a mess. I'm a messy person. I'm definitely one of those, you know, creative types who it's chaos and something gets made in the middle of that chaos. But then afterwards, there's a cleanup duty situation. So unfortunately, I am not a tidy human. I, I think I'm a quite organized human. Like I know where everything is, but it looks messy for sure. And finally, we have some writing questions. So Denny says gums, says, says gums. I don't know, I'm sorry. Asks, do I listen to music when I write? And if I do, what uh, do I think it inspires what I write? Um, I don't listen to music mostly when I write. I, I listen to sounds. So I listen to like a 10 hour rain playlist or like sea waves playlist. So it's more like soundscapes. I'll put my, a link to the exact one I listen to when writing in the description below. It's like a 10 hour playlist of rain with cars driving by. So I listen to like sounds more than music. Um, there are certain songs that I kind of think of for certain scenes. And that's mostly when I'm like including music in the scene. So like there's a scene where music is playing in the background um, in my first book. And I know like what song is playing in my head. I don't put the name of the song in the book. You can't often put um, I think you can put the names of songs, but you can't put song lyrics in your writing unless you get it like approved by the copyright holder of the song lyric. Fun fact there. Um, so you can't like quote song lyrics unless you're willing to pay or you can only quote so many lines of them in a published book that is. Obviously, when you're writing for yourself, it doesn't matter. But uh, like there's some Etta James songs that are mentioned in my second book. And in the first one, there's a scene where I imagine there's a song playing in the background and I imagine it to be Ben Gawan solo, which if you haven't seen In the Mood for Love, now you need to go watch In the Mood for Love, and then you can listen to that song a million times like I do. Gayla Layla 87 asks, what type of writing do you do? Do you practice plotting or just go for it? What type of writing do I do? I write first person POV speculative fiction currently. Um, it's very loosely speculative fiction. Uh, speculative fiction is kind of like vaguely sci-fi, but not hard sci-fi and or vaguely dystopian, things like that or like something about it is speculative. Um, so my books take place in a vague future that is kind of dystopian-ish setting. And uh, there's like sci-fi-ish elements in the sense like, only in the sense that like, they have automatic vehicles that hover as opposed to ride along on wheels. But none of the, it's like only background. Like it's never, I never dive into the sci-fi elements world building side of things i'm much more focused on like just the characters so things are only mentioned if the character needs to mention them for a specific reason so i don't really go into super details about stuff other than the characters all it's all about like the relationships between the characters for me and that is like what's driving everything so the world building isn't isn't built that way i guess i don't know what i'm trying to say 
Um, basically, speculative fiction, first person POV, to answer that question, I think, the most technical way. Um, and do I practice plotting or just go for it? This is like, um, believe in writing speak, it's called plotting or pantsing, aka flying by the seat of your pants or just writing what comes to you as it comes to you. Um, and it seems that a lot of people are one or the other, but I'm definitely both, funny enough. So usually I will start by just going for it. When I start a project, when I start like a book um, or a new universe or story, uh, usually the middle comes to me. And by that I mean like, it'll be like a random chapter somewhere in the center of the story. So my first book I ever wrote, I wrote chapter 10 first. And the second book I wrote, I wrote chapter 16 first. So I usually write like either the pivotal or like the one or before or right after chapter first. And I write the conversations first and then kind of build out from there. So it's usually dialogue between characters is the first thing I'll write for a story. Um, and then I will write the rest of it spinning out from that. Um, so a lot of times when I'm first starting a book, I'll usually write like a chapter in the middle and I'll be like, huh, I wonder how we got there. And I'll usually write a couple of chapters at the start and then I might even write the end. <laughs> and then I kind of have to figure out what happened in between all of these things. Um, so I might even have some footage here of when I was doing this for my second book of me laying out sticky notes, because that's how I did it last time, is I took the chapters I had already written and wrote them onto sticky notes, put them down on a table, and then I filled in with other sticky notes, one sticky note representing one chapter, what needed to happen in between. And it was more, it's less like what needs to happen in between or figuring out what happens in between. It's more just like, I don't know, it feels like filling it in as opposed to making it up or finding it in some ways. It almost feels like I need the characters to tell me what went down as opposed to me telling them what went down, weirdly enough. That makes me sound like a mad person. But then again, I'm not ruling it out. Grotto Serpentina asks, I don't know what the rule of law is regarding having your book published with an agent. If you self-publish on Amazon, will this automatically disqualify you from getting published through a literary house? This is a question I would like to address because people are always telling me to self-publish again. Um, yes, is the answer to this question, basically. Like the majority of the time, the answer to this question is yes. You are disqualifying yourself from not only that particular piece of work ever getting published traditionally, but possibly any of your future works getting published traditionally. From all the research I have done into this kind of thing, it seems like if you want to be traditionally published, it is a mistake to self-publish um, in any way, shape, or form for, beforehand. Um, there are exceptions to this rule, of course. Most notably, Andy Weir of The Martian fame. I think his name is Andy Weir. Andy Weir and The Martian. I think he was publishing that on a blog or like a Patreon kind of thing. I don't know. And then like eventually self-publishing it. Um, that did so well and got picked up by the right people or seen by the right people. And obviously made a film, made a book, all that stuff. So that's a one in a million chance. And the, the story to take away from that is that the only way you get a traditional publishing deal after self-publishing is if your book does wildly well <laughs> and is amazing and like does, not even that it's amazing, but that it does super, super well. Um, because if you self-publish and your book doesn't sell that many copies, all you've done there is prove to people that you are not sellable. Um, that your works aren't saleable or that you're bad at marketing. Because when you self-publish, there's no marketing team or publishing house behind your book to push it. There's no one putting it on the end cap at the bookstore. There's no one putting it onto Oprah's book list. There's no one to help you market it except for you. So when you self-publish, you don't get to be an author anymore. You suddenly have to be a marketer, which is part of the reason, again, I don't like to self, like the idea of self-publishing is because I don't want to be a salesperson for my book. I want to write books. I don't want to sell books. Um, so a publishing house, not only do they publish your book, but they also promote it for you. I mean, you're expected to do some promotion, of course, but not on the same level that you have to when you are self-publishing. So yeah, that was a longer answer, but I just get people telling me all the time, hey, don't you know you can publish on Amazon? It's like, yes, I am aware that self-publishing is a thing, but I would like to have a chance at having a career as an author. So I'm not going to do that. Trace and Tulu Musker ask, what age did you, um, were you when you realized you wanted to be a writer and why didn't you study that at university? Mostly because I discovered I wanted to be a writer about halfway through university. So it's a bit too late then. Um, but also I don't think there's any point and hold on, wait, controversial opinion. 
I'm going to, I'm going to release a controversial opinion. People are going to disagree with me on this one. Are you ready? I don't think there's any point doing a degree in writing. Sorry. Um, getting an English degree and like reading a whole bunch, I think is almost a better idea than getting a degree in like, say, creative writing or something like that. I don't think there's any point in doing that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you can try and convince me I'm wrong in the comments, but I like my own degree, which is apparel design, um, a fashion degree. I also don't think that is a good idea either. So to be fair, I also don't think my own degree and choice was great. But you know, when we make people decide things at 18, I don't know. but at what age did you realize you wanted to be a writer? Um, I think probably not until I was like, probably not until 2018 did I realize I don't think I have any other choice than to try and become a writer. But I didn't become like this passionate and sure about writing being like the thing for me, like being my end all and be all uh, and wanting to make it my career. I didn't feel this way until after I wrote, or until I was writing my first complete book, the one that I should be querying and all that stuff. Um, it's called The Orphan's Revenge. Again, the title may change by the time it gets if and when it ever gets published. So I might as well just use a title so we can talk about it uh, when you'll know what I'm saying or know what I'm talking about. Um, I wrote in 2018 a book called The Orphan's Revenge. Um, and it wasn't until I wrote that that I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah, this is it for me. Um, that book was like a surprise bolt of lightning in my life. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I hope other people like it as much as I do. As someone was saying on my last video, I was looking at comments today for my last video about writing and um, they were saying how like I put myself down a lot, um, which I'm sorry it comes off that way, but um, not about my writing. I don't, while I'm very unsure and, and scared about it never getting published, that's not because I don't believe in the work itself. I love that book a lot more than, you know, I, I like it better than being loved as Marge Piercy was saying in that last video. Um, so it's not that I'm worried it won't get published because it's bad. I'm worried it won't get published because getting published is like a very lucky thing to have happen to you. Um, but I love that book. It changed my life and the course that I was setting my life on almost. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> I hope you all get to read it someday. And Cabin Richmond did ask if I have beta readers or a writing group and how did I find them? I don't know if I would like a writing group because... I'm again, not a very social person. And I don't know if this is down to me being a cancer. Not that I believe in astrology. I don't, but um, I don't take criticism super well in the moment. Uh, so I don't know if I would do well with like a live critique session, but I do have beta readers or I have had beta readers for my first book. Um, I think I've had four, like four and a half people read my book, my book that I should be querying. I, it's hard now that I have two finished because I mean they're all they're both in the same universe <laughs> the first one's called the orphan's revenge the second one's called the cicada again those titles may change by the time they get published but I have had four people four different people have read the orphan's revenge uh the book that I'm trying to query um or going to be trying to query <laughs> my first people who read it were my mom's friends actually some of my mom's friends like family friends actually um, that I know a little bit, but not very well. They didn't know me very well at all. And like, we don't see them very often at all. So it's kind of nice to have people who were not afraid to hurt my feelings or be like, dude, no, <laughs> um, when I gave them this book. Um, and they read the book and they actually read it aloud to one another, which I dare you to find anything cuter than that. Um, uh, you can't, um, but they actually printed the manuscript and wrote like notes on it and stuff like that, which was really, really, really awesome for me to have. Um, and I had a really great long, long lunch meeting talking about the book with them. And it was so like enlightening and amazing to have that meeting with them. And again, it's nice to have people who aren't related to you and you don't know very well read your work because they can be more honest with you. Um, and so they were, and which was amazing. Um, what was more amazing was that they liked it. Um, so that was very encouraging for me. And then also my brother has read it, uh, who of course is a family member and therefore so you would think is slightly biased, but like, I don't know if it's a brother sister thing or sibling kind of thing where it's like, if it was bad, I feel like he would tell me again. Um, he's like not a reader at all. He doesn't read books as a hobby ever. Um, <laughs> so getting him to, re like he read it because 
as a favor to me and because he loves me, which is very kind of him, um, which was a surprise for both of us that he liked it, which was awesome. Um, he gave me lots of good feedback. He is a great beta reader. After he would like read a chapter, he would come in and we would talk about it for a while, which was just awesome to be able to talk to a reader as they were going through it. Um, and he's read both of my books actually, but, and like, <laughs> it's not easy to put into words how much it means to me that he has read them. Cause he's the only one in my family who has, um, so yeah, it definitely will be, my first book will be dedicated to him. It's been mostly positive responses from betas. And I know that like, you really, you want to have beta readers who don't know you at all. And half of these people in some ways are like, most of these people knew me at least a little bit. And then my brother, of course, has grown up with me, knows me a lot. Um, so you would like complete imparti impartiality on behalf of beta readers. But I feel like most of the, the three out of the four, <laughs> I have a lot of impartiality on. So I take, I hope I can trust what they told me. Um, but I have a lot of faith in the book too. So there's always that. But as far as like how I found beta readers, I tangentially kn knew them, which is not ideal, but was the case for me. I keep yawning and I'm actually quite exhausted now, so I better call it a night with your questions. Thank you so much for leaving me your questions. I really, really appreciate it. I hope I was able to get to a lot of your questions, even if you weren't the ones asking them, um, if you know what I mean. A lot of the questions were similar, so hopefully I answered your question, if I, even if I didn't read out your specific question. Hopefully I still answered it. See, I've lost the ability to speak. I need to go. <laughs> um, but again, if I didn't answer your question in this video, it's possible that I answered a similar question before in one of my other Q and A's. So check those out too. If you are still curious about me and want to hear me answer more questions from the past, my opinions uh, remain quite constant. I don't change much as a person. So everything I said last year in my other Q and A's remains true, I'm sure. And as well, if you would like to learn more about me or uh, see more personal kind of content from me, um, you can check out my series side hustling here on the channel. It is where I vlog in a more diary kind of style way and talk more about myself and my career goals and things like that in my side hustling series. So if you haven't checked that out, feel free to get to know me really maybe too well uh, over there on the side hustling series. Um, thank you so much to all of you who watched those and this and all of my videos. I really appreciate it. And I will see you again later this week. Bye.